All right, my friends, we're almost done with doing our local setup of Kubernetes. We've set up our deployments. We've got the cluster IPs, our persistent volumes, secrets, environment variables, the whole shebang. The very last thing we have to do is somehow allow traffic to get into our application. Now you'll recall that we had previously allowed people to connect directly to the multi-client pod over here through the use of a node port. But a node port is only really good for use inside of a development environment, and we certainly want to eventually take this application into production. So rather than using a node port, we're going to start to wire up an ingress service to our application. Now in this section in particular, we're going to get a couple of words in on exactly what an ingress service is. But before we do, I want to tell you about the third type of service that we had very quickly mentioned exists, but didn't really go into a lot of detail on. And that's a service called a load balancer. So we're going to very quickly give you a brief overview on a load balancer type service and talk about why we're not going to use it. And then we'll move on to talking about ingresses and all that whatnot. All right, so for services, remember, these are objects that are meant to set up some type of networking inside of our cluster. We've made use of a cluster IP, which allows other pods to get access to a particular service or a particular set of pods. We've got the node port, which we just discussed again, and the load balancer. Now, this is a legacy way of getting some amount of traffic into your application. You're going to see a lot of documents or blog posts refer to load balancers, but whenever you do, check the date on the blog post. It might be a little bit dated. And ingress is the newer and supposedly better way of getting traffic into your cluster. But again, quick discussion on a load balancer and why we're not going to use it. All right, so a load balancer actually does two separate things inside of your cluster. First off, to create a load balancer type service, we would make a configuration file of type service and a subtype of load balancer. When you set that up, you're going to essentially allow access to one specific set of pods inside of your application. Remember, the goal of a service is to kind of manage access or provide networking to reach a set of pods. And so a load balancer only is going to give you access to one set of pods. In our case, our application has two set of pods that we want to expose to the outside world, which is 100% common. Your application might need to have a very similar type of setup. So a load balancer would not be able to give us access to both the multi-server set and the multi-client as well. Now, when you make a load balancer service, you are not only getting access to a specific set of pods. When you make a load balancer service, Kubernetes is going to actually do something in the background for you as well. It's going to reach out to your cloud provider, so be it AWS or Google Cloud or whoever else you might be using, and it's going to create a load balancer using their configuration or definition of what a load balancer is. So in the AWS world, you might get a classic load balancer or an application load balancer. There's one other third kind of load balancer that escapes me off the top of my head as well. Kubernetes is going to tell AWS, hey, I need like a application load balancer or a classic load balancer. So it's going to set up this external resource outside of your cluster, and then it's going to automatically configure that load balancer to send traffic into your cluster and access the load balancer service that has been set up to govern access to this very specific set of pods. So that's what a load balancer does. Again, kind of a more legacy thing. Supposedly, some people say it's deprecated, but it's really hard to look at the end, the Kubernetes official documentation and see something that specifically says deprecated. So I'm not 100% sure if it is deprecated, but certainly older way and again, not really appropriate for us because again, we've got these two different things that we want to expose to the outside world. So with that in mind, we are going to be using an ingress service instead to get app traffic into our cluster. So let's take a quick pause right here. In the next section, I want to give you a quick notes, a couple quick notes on ingress, some high level things that you just need to be aware of. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we had a quick discussion about load balancers and we discussed why they're not quite appropriate for our application. In this section, we're going to move forward and talk about ingresses. This is a type of service that is going to eventually get some amount of traffic into our application and allow our outside users to access all the different pods that are running containers that they need to get at to actually access our app. All right, so quick diagram here. So as you might guess, yep, traffic's going to come in. It's going to hit this thing called an ingress, and then it's going to be sent off or routed off to either our client set of pods or the server set of pods. Now, in the world of Kubernetes, there are several different implementations of an ingress. 
we are going to be using a very specific implementation called an Nginx ingress. Now, before we talk about exactly what this Nginx ingress is, how it works, all that kind of stuff, I wanna have a very important discussion with you. Really critical that you pay attention to this because if you don't, it's gonna make things really, really confusing when you go and start to look up documentation. Okay, so here's the very important note, the very important thing you gotta understand. So you and I are going to be using a project called Ingress Nginx. That's the name of the project. This is a community-led project, and by community-led, I mean that it is a part of the official Kubernetes organization. So it's led by people from Kubernetes, full endorsement of the Kubernetes project, a lot of backing, a lot of strength behind this project. I put the link to the GitHub repository for it right here. So you can try to visit that repository and you're going to see, okay, here's the page, documentation, you see some stuff called like Nginx Ingress Controller. Now, in addition to this ingress called Ingress Nginx, there is a completely separate project, totally separate, that does almost the exact same thing with almost an identical name. So a separate project out there is called Kubernetes Ingress. And this is also an Nginx based ingress. It is a project led by the company Nginx. It does like the same exact thing, almost identical name, but it's 100% separate, totally separate. And so right here, this is the GitHub repository for it. I'm going to go there as well. And if you scroll down to the readme, you're going to see that this repository also has a title of Nginx Ingress Controller. Well, here's the project that we're using, and it's also called, very helpfully, <laughs> Nginx Ingress Controller. So yeah, like these things are nearly identical in looking, but they, again, they are very much separate projects and they work differently. So whenever you are looking up documentation, you gotta be like 100% certain that you're looking at documentation for the Ingress Nginx project. So in general, I recommend that you go to this GitHub repository, probably even bookmark it right now, and anytime that you need to look up documentation, come to this repo, make sure you're looking at Kubernetes Ingress Nginx, and then try to access documentation from this page. Because otherwise you might accidentally fall into looking at documentation for the other project, the Kubernetes Ingress project. All right. So I know this is really confusing, but again, I wanted to make a really big deal about this and make sure that it's 100% clear that yes, these are two separate projects. We are not using this one, we are using this one. So with that in mind, let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section with one or two other brief notes. In the last section, we spoke about how there are two Ingress projects out there that have very, very similar names and are very similar in nature, but again, they are completely separate things. In this section, I want to do a very quick follow-up on Ingress Nginx, which is what we are using. So very important note here, I want you to understand one other very important thing. The setup of this Ingress is going to be slightly different, or in some cases, very different, depending upon the environment that you are using it in. So if you are deploying this Ingress Nginx thing in your local environment, or Google Cloud, or AWS, or Azure, it's going to be very different in each of these different environments. In this course, you and I are going to set up Ingress Nginx on our local machine, and we're also going to be setting it up on Google Cloud. So that's kind of like a big reveal here. Yes, we're going to deploy our Kubernetes cluster to Google Cloud and not AWS, even though we used AWS previously in this course. So that might be a little bit of a surprise. You might be a little bit disappointed to hear that we're not using AWS, but there are some extraordinarily good reasons that we are using Google Cloud over AWS. And I'll tell you in great detail what those reasons are when we start moving over to production. So this is the other note that I want to throw out there just to make sure you are 100% aware that this ingress stuff as uh, you probably are able to tell, it's a little bit finicky right now in the world of Kubernetes. You know, you got these identical projects, the setup is very different depending upon the environment. So you know, hopefully we're gonna get through this stuff together without too much pain, but we'll see what happens. So with the second note in mind, let's continue the next section and we're going to get started on our Nginx Ingress setup. In the last section, we had a quick discussion around the differences between Ingress Nginx and Kubernetes Ingress. We're now going to continue and start to talk about how this Ingress stuff works behind the scenes to somehow get some amount of traffic into your application. So let's get to it. Now, I want to first begin by giving you a quick reminder of how we've been doing things throughout this entire course. Throughout the entire course, we've been making config files that contain the desired state of our application. 
So for example, we've been writing config files that say that we want to be running three pods or three replicas, each of which run the multi-client image. We then feed that into kubectl, and that creates a deployment object. And it's up to that deployment object to look at our current state and then look at our desired state and figure out some migration path or some way to get from the current state to the desired state. And so after the deployment jumps into effect and starts working, it's going to eventually create three new pods, each of which are running the multi-client image. Now, the reason I'm giving you this reminder about how all this stuff works is that this deployment object right here is what we refer to as a type of controller. In Kubernetes, a controller is any type of object that constantly works to make some desired state a reality inside of our cluster. So in the world of ingresses, and as we start to talk about ingress, the exact same strategy right here all applies 100%. You and I are going to write some config file that describes a set of routing rules to take incoming traffic and send it off to the appropriate services inside of our cluster. We're then going to feed that config file into kubectl, and kubectl is going to create something called an ingress controller. So it is a controller. It is something that's going to look at our current state. It's going to look at the desired state and then create some infrastructure that's going to make our desired state a reality. So in the case of our particular ingress controller, which is, as you might guess, using Nginx behind the scenes, when we feed in this config file, the controller is going to create a pod running Nginx that's going to have a very particular set of rules to make sure that traffic comes in and gets sent off to the appropriate different services inside of our cluster. So you can kind of think that this entire setup around ingress looks a little something like this. We have our ingress config over here, which is our config file that describes all the routing rules that we want to have inside of our application. That's going to be fed into kubectl where an ingress controller is going to be constantly working behind the scenes to make sure that all of the routing rules that we define inside the ingress config are actually implemented and met. And so it's going to be up to the ingress controller to create something, something, you know, who knows what it is, but something inside of our cluster that will take the incoming traffic, read some parameters in that traffic, and then send it off to the appropriate service. So the big takeaway right here, the only thing I want you to understand right now is that you and I are going to create something called an ingress config, which is going to be a set of routing rules. We're going to feed it into kubectl, which is going to create this ingress controller. And the ingress controller's job is to look at the ingress config or that set of routing rules and make that a reality. The ingress controller has to create some infrastructure inside of our cluster to make sure that we're actually obeying those routing rules. And so the ingress controller is going to make, again, something that accepts incoming traffic. Okay, so that's the kind of high level description of what's going on here. Now, in the case of the project that we are using, ingress nginx, things are going to work very similar to this, but just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit differently. And so infinitesimally differently, differently that I almost don't even want to tell you that it's working differently, but I am anyways, just so you understand how things are working behind the scenes. So with the very particular project that we are using of ingress nginx, the ingress controller and the thing that actually accepts traffic and routes it off to the appropriate location is actually the same thing. So with the very particular ingress project that we are using, the ingress controller and the thing that routes traffic is the same thing. So we can kind of imagine, again, that you and I are going to make a ingress config or a set of routing rules. We're going to feed it into kubectl. And then the project that we are using Ingress Nginx is going to create a single deployment whose job is to both read in the Ingress config and simultaneously create a pod that meets all of those different routing rules. Now, again, this is a very tiny, tiny, tiny distinction. And I only mention this to you because we are going to look at some of the behind the scenes setup of Ingress Nginx inside of our project. And you're going to notice that there are not like the three separate things that I show you right here. In our project, there's only the two separate things as shown in this diagram right here. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a quick pause. We're gonna come back to the next section and there's just a little bit more around some behind the scenes action for this ingress stuff that I wanna show you before we start going through the setup. So quick break and I'll talk to you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about the three separate pieces of setting up ingress inside of Kubernetes. So we've got the ingress config, 
we've got the thing that actually implements that configuration, and then we've got the thing that actually takes incoming traffic and sends it off to the appropriate service. So I now want to take this type of approach right here and apply it to the actual application that we are looking at. Now there is going to be one little twist here. Remember that I had told you just a little bit ago that the setup of all this ingress stuff changes a little bit depending upon your environment. So we're going to look at a diagram here that describes how all this stuff is set up specifically on Google Cloud. So the actual implementation when we set this up locally is going to be just a little bit different, but the Google Cloud implementation is probably the easiest to understand and kind of wrap your head around. So here's what's going to happen. Again, you and I are going to make an in ingress config file, and that's going to describe all the routing rules that should exist inside of our application. This config is going to be fed into a deployment that is running both our controller, the ingress controller, and an nginx pod. And that nginx pod is what's going to actually take incoming traffic and route it off to the appropriate location. Now, specifically on Google Cloud, there's some other pieces in here that get created at the same time as well. So when we make an ingress on Google Cloud, we are going to get a Google Cloud load balancer created for us. This is a cloud native load balancer, identical to the one that you would use with any other type of application that you might happen to create on Google Cloud. In fact, you can open up a new tab right now and search Google Cloud load balancer, and you'll see some marketing page here for Google Cloud load balancing. So this is the actual object behind the scenes that's going to be created by Google Cloud to somehow get traffic into our cluster. Once that load balancer is in effect, inside the cluster itself, the deployment that gets created is going to get a load balancer service attached to it. Yes, the same load balancer service that we had discussed a little bit ago. So even though we had spoken about this thing and we had said, oh yeah, the load balancer service is kind of a little bit legacy and we don't really use it anymore and we prefer to use Ingress, well, behind the scenes on Google Cloud, the load balancer service is still being used. And you wouldn't quite know it unless you actually looked at some of the source code or config files that set all this stuff up. So incoming traffic will come to the Google Cloud load balancer. That load balancer is going to send that traffic to a load balancer service inside the cluster, which is going to eventually get that traffic into the Nginx pod that gets created by our ingress controller. It's then up to that Nginx pod to eventually send that traffic off to the appropriate service inside of our application, either the multi-client or the multi-server. Now there's one last little piece of the puzzle here that I just want you to be aware of. By default, when you set up all this Nginx ingress stuff, there's going to be another deployment set up inside of your cluster, something called a default backend. The default backend is used for a series of health checks to essentially make sure that your cluster is working the way that it should be working. Now we're going to be making use of the default backend inside this course, but ideally, like in an ideal world, you would actually replace the default backend pod right here with your Express API server. And so anytime that the Nginx pod needs to check the health status of our application, it would be ideal to tell it to reach out to the multi-server as opposed to the default backend. And I'll show you very quickly how you could do that later on. But for right now, I just want you to be aware that there is going to be this additional deployment inside of our application. Okay, so that's it. That's what's happening behind the scenes. Now, one last quick thing here, something that you might be a little bit curious about. So at this point, we've said, oh yeah, we, you know, we're actually using this load balancer service and the load balancer service is getting traffic eventually into an Nginx pod. So why, oh why, would we not just do this stuff manually to a degree? You know, why are we gonna go through all this extra setup of this ingress stuff and the ingress config and a whole bunch of additional setup on top of that when we could take a much more straightforward and simplistic approach? Something like this right here. Why do we not just set up our own load balancer service manually that points to our own custom copy of Nginx? We've already made use of Nginx quite a bit throughout this course, so why do you and I not just make our own kind of custom Nginx server that sends traffic off to the appropriate set of pods? Well, the reason that we are still going to make use of Ingress Nginx as opposed to setting the stuff, man stuff up manually is that when you make use of the Nginx Ingress project, it actually has a bunch of code added into it that is very much aware of the fact that it is operating inside of a Kubernetes cluster. So as one 
little example. There's many examples of this, but I'm going to give you one very quick example. When you make use of the Nginx ingress project, rather than taking incoming traffic and sending it off to the cluster IP and allowing the cluster IP to load balance that request off to some random pod inside of here, the Nginx ingress project is not actually going to send traffic over to the cluster IP service and allow that to do some amount of load balancing. Instead, the cluster IP service does still exist and it still is working to essentially keep track of all these different pods. But anytime we get an incoming request to the Nginx pod right here, the Nginx pod is going to actually route the request directly to one of these different pods, completely bypassing that cluster IP service. The reason that this is done is to allow for features like, say, sticky sessions, which is a reference to the fact that we sometimes want to make sure that if one user sends two requests to our application, we want to make sure that both those requests go to the exact same server. And there's some cases where that feature is extremely handy and actually 100% necessary to have. So that's just one example of why we are making use of this Ingress Nginx project, as opposed to kind of doing our own build-it-yourself solution. So you certainly can do a build-it-yourself solution. It's just going to lose out on a couple of these extra features that you get for free when you make use of the Ingress Nginx project. OK, so enough on all, all this. I think we've had enough discussion around the theory. And all that's really left is going through the setup process. So let's take a quick pause right here. In the next section, we're going to start setting up Ingress Nginx inside of our project. In this section, we're going to start setting up Ingress Nginx on our local project. We're actually going to follow the setup directions that are tied directly to the GitHub repository. So to get started, I'm going to first navigate to this address right here. So github.com kubernetes slash ingress nginx. And then once here, I'm going to find the link to the documentation at the very top. So this link right here. Then once on the home page, I'll find the deployment tab at the very top and we're going to walk through this installation guide together. Now the installation guide is a little bit confusing, which is why we're going to walk through it together. So the first thing that we want to find is generic deployment. We have to go through this mandatory command right here for any of the other deployment targets. So even if we're trying to deploy to Azure or GCE or AWS, whatever it is, we have to execute this mandatory command right here. So we can take that command, copy paste it, and then run it inside of our terminal. But before we do, I want to very quickly show you what is going on behind the scenes with the command. So I encourage you to copy the link that's listed right here. You'll notice that at the very end, it's actually a YAML file. So it's a config file very similar to all the config files that you and I have been creating throughout this course. Then inside of my browser, I'm going to visit the link to that config file like so. And so you're going to see something very quickly pop up. This is all the config that is going to be executed when we try to set up this Ingress Nginx project locally. Now, there's a couple of different objects inside of here that are going to be created that I just want to very quickly point out to you. You'll notice that the first thing that is created right here is something called a namespace. A namespace is used to kind of isolate the different resources that we are creating inside of our Kubernetes cluster. And it's something we'll discuss just a little bit later on. Immediately after that, we'll see a deployment with the name of default HTTP backend. So again, this is a little deployment right here that is going to be created for us that's going to essentially serve as a health check and tell the Nginx pod that, yeah, our cluster is working the way that is expected to work. We can certainly omit the step right here and skip the default HTTP backend if we want to. The only thing that we have to do is to make sure that we instead point it at some other image that's going to, first off, serve a 404 page at the root route, and second off, serve a 200 on the slash health Z route. So again, we could certainly implement these two steps right here inside of our multi-server pod if we had wanted to. That means that we would not have to create this default backend. But again, we're going to make use of the default backend just to save ourselves a tiny bit of work. Now, as you scroll down a little bit further, you're going to see that we get a service created for the default backend. After that, you're going to see a couple of different things called config maps. Config maps are essentially objects that hold some amount of configuration that can be used throughout our cluster. We're not going to be too concerned with that stuff right now, so I'm going to keep on going. Pass the service account, or excuse me, yeah, service account, pass the cluster role. We're going to go down towards the very bottom, 
and eventually find the deployment with the name of Nginx Ingress Controller. So again, in just this project that we're making use of, just this Ingress Nginx project, the Ingress Controller and the thing that is accepting incoming traffic is actually one singular object. So just with this one particular project, those two things kind of get merged together or sandwiched into this one single thing. And so if you look at the config for this object right here, you're going to see inside the containers definition that it's essentially starting up a copy of Nginx, but simultaneously, it's also going to read in some amount of config that tells this copy or this controller exactly how the Nginx copy should be configured. So that's all going on inside this config right here. You'll also see that there's some configuration that customizes that liveliness probe on the health Z route and also sets up the 404 somewhere inside of here on the root route as well, although I'm not immediately seeing it. Okay, so enough of that. Let's go back over to the installation guide. Again, I'm going to copy the entire mandatory command and then I'll go into my terminal and I'm going to paste that and run it like so. Now we're going to very quickly see a huge variety of different objects be created. So we'll just kind of leave that for right now. Before we continue, we have to go through one other setup step, specifically for Minikube. So back up here, I'm going to click on Minikube. And then it tells us that for standard usage, which is what we are doing, all we have to do is run this command right here, which says Minikube add-ons enable ingress. So I'm going to copy that command, go back over to my terminal, and I'm going to make sure I copy it this time. There we go. And then we should see that ingress was successfully enabled. Now the very last thing that I want to show you, you'll recall that I just told you that on Google Cloud, a load balancer service is actually going to be created. And that load balancer service is going to simultaneously create the external load balancer for us as well. So as a little sneak peek, if you want to, you could scroll on down to the configuration for GCE right here. And then again, you can copy the link to the config file for GCE. And then if you open that up in a new tab again, this is what is going to be created specifically on Google Cloud. And so as you'll notice, it is in fact a service that is, has type load balancer. And so specifically on Google Cloud, a load balancer is created to route traffic into your application through the use of a load balancer service. I thought that was just a little bit interesting because you know, even though we're saying, oh yeah, load balancers are a little bit dated as a service in the world of Kubernetes, even this newer feature of Ingress is still using a load balancer behind the scenes. So again, I just thought it was a little bit interesting. All right, so that's all we had to do to set up the Ingress locally. So let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to start to configure our Ingress resource. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we set up Ingress Nginx on our local machine. Now the last thing we have to do is create a new config file that's going to specify the different sets of routing rules that we want to use inside of our application. We're going to use the exact same routing rules that we had to use back on some of our previous projects, specifically the Elastic Beanstalk one, where we set up our own custom Nginx server. So if you recall, back on that project, we had said that anytime we had some amount of incoming traffic, we looked at the path of the request. And we had said that if the request started with slash API, we were going to automatically send that request off to the server. Otherwise, we would send the request off to the client, assuming that it needed to access some of the client side resources. So we're going to set up a ingress config file right now that's going to implement this routing rule set. So inside of my code editor, I'm going to find my k8s directory. And inside there, I'm going to make a new file called ingress service.yaml. Then inside of here, we're going to write out our config file that, as usual, is going to look very similar to a lot of the other config files we've already put together. So I'm going to specify an API version. This one is going to have a longer version on it that we've not used before. We'll say extensions v1 beta 1. The kind of object we are going to create is an ingress. We'll then set up our metadata. So we'll give it a name of ingress service. And then unlike previous metadata fields we've set up, this one is actually going to have a couple of other metadata properties as well. So I'm going to add on a new thing to this called annotations. Annotations are essentially additional configuration options that are going to specify a little bit kind of higher level configuration around the ingress object that it gets created. So the first thing we're going to do here 
we're going to add on kubernetes.io slash ingress.class of nginx like so. So this configuration rule right here is essentially telling Kubernetes that we want to create a ingress controller based on the nginx project. Then immediately after that, we're going to add in another configuration rule that's going to specifically configure how our copy of nginx behaves. So I'm going to say nginx.ingress.kubernetes.io slash rewrite target slash like so. So this additional annotation right here, again, this is going to configure how the actual copy of nginx behaves. This rule in particular says that if we end up matching a route like slash API right here, after deciding to send it to the server, that configuration is going to first do a little bit of a rewrite on the request. And essentially it's going to remove the slash API part. Now, again, we did a step like this very similar back on the Elastic Beanstalk project that we put together. We had said that we probably did not want to put some configuration inside of our server that very tightly coupled it to the routing that got the request to the server in the first place. So we had decided to remove the slash API out of the incoming request, just so that we did not have to write slash API on every different route on the server itself. Okay, so that's exactly what this line of configuration is doing right here. So now after that, we'll unindent and we'll add in a spec. So for the spec, we're gonna add a series of different rules. In our case, we're gonna have just one rule. So I'm gonna put in a single dash like so, and then I'll say HTTP paths. This is going to be an array as well. So I'll do a dash and I'll say path slash backend is going to be service name of our cluster client cluster IP service, which has the name of client cluster IP service. and a service port of 3000. I'll then add in another path here of slash API slash. I'll give it a backend as well. This is going to have a backend that points at the, where is it? Server cluster IP service right here, which has a name of server cluster IP service. And a service port of 5000. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what's happening here. Now we discussed the annotations and then we very quickly dove into all the different rules. So our rules are saying that there are two possible paths that we can match traffic to. If someone ever comes to the path of just slash by itself or any route that looks like slash followed by anything besides slash API, then we want to send that request to whatever set of pods are governed by the service of client cluster IP service. And again, we just referred to the name of that other service as we had designated it inside of our client cluster IP service file. Then if a request came in with a leading route name of slash API, we wanted to, to instead send it to the set of, of pods that are governed or managed by the server cluster IP service. So essentially we're setting up the exact same relationship that you just saw in this diagram right here. The nginx configuration that we're putting together is going to send all this incoming traffic to either the multi-client set of pods governed by this cluster IP service or the multi-server set of pods governed by this cluster IP service. We don't have to actually specify the IP address of these servers inside of our cluster. We just refer to the name of the service. And then all this nginx ingress stuff is going to figure it out from there. You'll notice that we also had to specify the port for both these services as well. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this config file. Now, the description that I've given you of this config file is pretty light at this point in time. Like I haven't really told you about why we have multiple rules in here or this HTTP flag or stuff like that. We are going to actually come back to this file over time and make a couple of additions to it over time. So don't we worry, we are gonna come back to this file and have some further discussion about what's going on inside of here. Now, the last thing I want to do is take this file and apply it with kubectl, which should set up some networking inside of our application. So I'm going to flip on over to my terminal, and I'm going to do a kubectl apply dash f, and then as usual, we'll just apply everything inside of the k8s directory. So I'm going to run that, and somewhere inside of here, we should see ingress service created right there.
So let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna do a little bit of work to make sure that the ingress is up and running as we would expect. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we finished up our ingress nginx configuration, and then we applied it using kubectl. We can now test out our application inside the browser because we should have just created everything that's going to essentially get traffic into our application and then route it off to the appropriate service. To test this stuff out, we're gonna flip over to our terminal and we're going to get the IP of our Minikube virtual machine. So I'm gonna run Minikube IP and then I'll copy this IP address and I'll visit it inside of my browser. Now this time around, we do not have to specify a port on this IP because the service that we have created is automatically listening on both ports 80 and 443 for us. And by default, your browser is going to default to either port 80 or 443, depending upon whether or not you are using a HTTPS connection. All right, so when I go there, you're gonna very quickly see a big security message appear on the screen. Now, I've already bypassed that warning message, but when you first navigate to this IP address, it's gonna tell you, hey, danger, there's a security issue here. At the bottom left-hand side of that config or that error message, you'll see a little like get more info button. Go ahead and click on that button, and then you can click on proceed anyway. So at present, our Nginx configuration is attempting to force anyone who comes to our page to use a HTTPS connection as opposed to HTTP. By default, the Nginx ingress is going to use a kind of dummy certif certificate. So if you click on not secure up here and then click on certificate, you'll see that it has a name of Kubernetes ingress controller fake certificate. And as you might guess, a fake certificate is not going to be accepted by Chrome at large. So the error message that you're seeing is going to be something that we're only going to have locally in development. When we eventually push this off to production, we're gonna fix this error message. But for right now, in development, we're just gonna let this sit as is. You only have to click past that error message screen one time. After you click there at least one time, you should be able to refresh the page and you're not gonna see the error again. You're just gonna see the HTTPS error, which is something that we can essentially palette right now for development purposes. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We should now be able to test out our application by entering in some index. I'll submit that, I'll refresh the page, and I should see all my numbers appear. So if you see all this stuff appear correctly, that means that your entire Kubernetes cluster is completely set up and ready to go for development purposes. So I think that we've got a great project here so far. Let's take a pause right now. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna start thinking how we can migrate this project to a production environment. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. Our application is more or less now complete in a development environment, and we get to now start thinking about moving this over to production. We're going to start discussing that in just a moment, but before we do, I want to show you one last thing that might help you out with Kubernetes in a development environment. I did not show you this feature earlier on very much on purpose because it can kind of throw you a little bit off base if you know about this feature too soon. So this is why I kind of waited to the very end of the development side of things to show you this. All right, so I'm gonna flip over to my terminal really quick and I'm gonna run the command minikube dashboard, like so. So I'm gonna run that command and then you'll very quickly see a message that says Open it, opening Kubernetes dashboard in default browser and you'll get redirected over to your browser as well. So the page that's popped up here, you might notice is hosted on our minikube IP address at port 330,000. This is a dashboard that will show you information about everything that's going on inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And so it's actually a little bit fun to scroll through here and take a look at all the different deployments, pods, all this different stuff that has been created and is in service to somehow create and manage your cluster uh, with all your different containers and your entire application. So you can click through here a little bit and get a better idea of what's going on. You'll notice a couple of different pieces of terminology that we haven't quite spoken about just yet, such as say daemon sets and replica sets. And just, just so you know, as a quick side note here, we very specifically did not talk about replica sets or replication controllers because they're kind of deprecated and the recommendation is to use deployments instead of replica sets or replica replication controllers. So just so you know, some of these pieces of terminology you'll see in here, we very purposefully did not cover because they are things that you're not quite supposed to use or seen as the best way of doing things with Kubernetes anymore.
Anyways, I thought you might just find it a little bit interesting to click around here a little bit and take a look at some of the different services and pieces of data that exist in here. Now, I had said that I kind of purposefully did not show you this stuff earlier. The reason for that was that you can actually edit or even create different objects using this dashboard. But remember, any time we create an object in Kubernetes or any time we want to change something, we do not do imperative edits if we can ever avoid it. And so if you click Create up here, yeah, you can enter in a YAML file, but you don't really have a good record of what that YAML is. You can also say go to maybe pods over here and click on a pod and you can click on edit and make discrete changes to the YAML file or the config file directly right here. But again, if you make changes on the dashboard, they do not get somehow persisted back over to the folders and files that we've created inside of our project directory. So whenever possible, we always change the config files and not the actual configuration directly on this dashboard. So again, that's why I kind of wanted to hold off showing you this stuff right at the beginning because I didn't want you to kind of get into a habit of manually changing or creating different objects on here. We always want to prefer using config files inside of our project directory to manage these different objects. Okay, so again, you can take a look at this dashboard and just get a better idea of some of the different pieces of information that are displayed on here. Otherwise, let's take a pause right here and we'll continue in the next section and continue thinking about how we're going to move our application over to a production environment. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute.